In today's video, I'm going to run down the best carbohydrate sources to work into your diet and why you may want to choose certain carb sources over other carb sources based on your individual context. Now, before we jump into the actual carb sources to incorporate, I want to set some principles for you so that you're actually able to figure out which carb source is going to work for you and troubleshoot why something may not be working for you. So with that, let's jump into the first principles that we're going to use to determine whether we incorporate a carb source in our diet or not and some things that we want to look out for. So the biggest thing to start is figuring out whether you do well with starches or sugars. Now, starches are things like potatoes, yams, sweet potatoes, rice, oats, and then the sugars are more things that you would see with fruits. So fruit juice, whole fruits, frozen fruits, fresh fruits, etc. Most people that I work with on a regular basis tend to tolerate both and have a mix of them, but some people actually do better with starches and other individuals do better with sugars. So as an example, I myself don't really do well with starches. I get insomnia from them. They make me sleepy after meals and they slow down my digestion and I do way better on sugars. So most of my carbohydrate intake, my intake currently is between 450 to 500 grams per day, depending on how much exercise I'm doing that day is all sugars, all from fruits. I know that's mind blowing for, for some people, but I've been doing this for close to a decade at this point. And most of my intake is coming from sugars because every time I try to introduce starches, whether that's potatoes, whether that's yams, whether that's rice, whether that's oats, after a certain amount per day, I start to have problems. Now, I think the modulating factor here is digestive physiology. So are you, is your body good at digesting starches? I don't think mine is very good at digesting starches. It could have been related to my gallbladder surgery it could be related to other things like my amylase gene copy or things like this. And it also can be related to the microbiome. So if you have overgrowth of certain bacteria in the microbiome, like Klebsiella, that preferentially feed on starches, that can create a variety of nasty symptoms for you. And you may want to prioritize sugars. So for me, I prioritize sugars, but other individuals that I worked with don't do as well on sugars, don't do as well on fruit, don't do as well on juices. And then they actually use more starches. So whichever one works for you is completely fine. Just it's, it comes down to this individual tolerance piece. So just shoot for the one that works for you and run from there and test out and see what's going to work for you. Nobody can tell you exactly what's going to work best for you. What's going to tell you is your experience. You need to rely on your experience. You need to gather some data and see what's going to work for you and test out different foods in a relatively systematic way. So you can start to build out a diet that is specific to you and stop relying on an external authority who's going to tell you which thing is the best thing ever. There's, there's rationale between components. But we want to then take that rationale and graph that onto our own context instead of trying to graft our context onto this rationale or these theories and things like this. Now, the next component to look at with carb sources in general is going to be FODMAPs. So FODMAPs are fermentable carbohydrates that we cannot digest that go to the colon and then the bacteria and microbes in our gut can ferment them. Now, some FODMAPs don't cause problems for some people, whereas others cause huge problems. As an example here, I can eat broccoli all day long and get minor amounts of gas, but God forbid I eat yams. I don't think anybody listening would want to be in the same room as me. And that's because they make me extremely gassy. And this is just a function of the microbiome and perhaps my tolerance of starches, but I can eat things like broccoli, no issue. And then yams, sweet potatoes, starch, no problem. I've seen this time and time again with clients. I have individuals that I've worked with who are do terrible with cruciferous vegetables, but they can eat tons of yams and sweet potatoes and things like this. Other individuals can plow through garlic and onions in a meal, no issue, and other people absolutely wreck them. So this is where figuring out which, which different FODMAP source you can tolerate is comes down to you specifically. And there can't just be a blanket statement of all FODMAPs are bad or all FODMAPs are good. It really depends on what you tolerate, how you feel, and you construct a diet around that. And just as a quick side note, FODMAPs, F-O-D-M-A-P-S is an acronym which stands for fermentable oligosaturides, disaturides, monosaturides, and polyols. And it's just telling you the type of carbohydrate that you can tolerate or not. So basically that's, we want to look at FODMAP. So as an example here to see how this, how this works out for you, if you add in a bunch of apples on your diet, like our friend, uh, Dr. Sean Baker had did recently, and you start to get digestive issues, it's likely a FODMAP problem because apples are very high in sugar alcohols like sorbitol. And also the next thing we'll get to is glucose to fructose ratio. They have a very high fructose content in relation to glucose content, which can cause uh, digestive issues by leaving free fructose in the intestine where bacteria can ferment it. So glucose to fructose ratio is the amount of fructose present in a food versus the amount of glucose. Now, this is important because our intestine can actually only absorb fructose very well if glucose is present. 
So some people have the capacity to absorb in excess 25 to 50 grams of fructose in a meal, but some people can only absorb in excess of five. So there's a big wide range of tolerance. However, this is completely fixed if glucose is present. So if you have 50 grams of glucose and 50 grams of glucose of uh, fructose, you're fine. But if you have 50 grams of glucose and 75 grams of fructose, then you'll start to see digestive issues. This is also one of the problems we see in the fructose feeding studies where they give people or animals large boluses of free fructose in like 75 gram bolus of fructose. And then they see issues with metabolism. And you know, a large part of this is likely related to endotoxin production, which they see increase in the blood supply to the liver from the gut when they feed these animals fructose because the bacteria are just fermenting the fructose because it's not being absorbed. So we want to make sure that we are looking to see if these different sources are one-to-one -one glucose of fructose. Now, the next component to look into here in terms of tolerating different carb sources is going to be unique plant compounds. And this is something where the low carb and carnivore people will kind of get right is that different plant sources have different compounds that could be problematic for different individuals. And some of these compounds include things like acetogenins, which can be high in cherry moya and also high in soursop. And these can have a negative effect on mitochondrial function in the brain in very high amounts. However, if you don't eat the skin and the seeds or the leaves or the twigs or, or stems of this plant, you don't really have as much of an issue, but you also don't want to be slamming too much cherry moya or something like this, which is also unfortunate because it's probably the best tasting fruit, <laughs> at least in my opinion. Uh, other components are things like bromelain that you find in pineapples. A lot of people get this weird um, breakdown of the side of their mouth from bromelain when they eat pineapples or they get weird sensation in their mouth because the, the bromelain is a proteolytic enzyme that can start to degrade different um, tissues. And I think some people don't like, I don't ever have this effect from pineapple. I can eat it all day long because I think perhaps the structure of my tissue or the different carbohydrate components that are secreted lining the mucosa for me doesn't interact with bromelain like that. Whereas other people have a huge issue. I think there may be some inter individual differences there. I don't have an exact reason why some people have the problem and some people don't, but I do know that this is a problem for some people. Other example could be papain, which is another proteolytic enzyme we find in papaya or actinidin, which is something that we find in kiwis, alkaloids, which are things like chaconine, solanine, and tomatine that we can find in the nightshade family. And then we also have different uh, amino acids or different neurotransmitters that we can actually find in different fruits. For example, in things like plantains, we have very high serotonin content and that can cause some issues for certain people. So those are things to, to keep in mind. You may have a weird response to different fruits or foods based on these components. So you have the FODMAP, glucose to fructose, uh, you have whether it's starchier or more sugar or the unique plant compounds of that food. So it takes a little bit of troubleshooting to get them right. As a side note, I think this is why a lot of people actually switch to low carb and feel a bit better because when you're not on low carb, you're eating all of these plant foods and you don't know what's causing what. You're eating a bunch of grains, you're eating a bunch of legumes, maybe a bunch of nuts and seeds, you're bloated, you're gassy, and then you take that out and now you have that emptiness. People call it the meat zen, right? <laughs> you're just eating meat. You don't have anything in the coal and you're like, wow, I feel so much better. But, and to be fair, I felt a lot better on it and so do a lot of people I know, I know but I've, and clients that I've worked with but I've also got tons of digestive issues that adding in plant foods that I tolerated fixed, plus it lowered the stress for me. So it's really about finding the foods that specifically work for you overall. Now, the next component that we want to look at here with carb sources is the blood glucose regulation and speed of absorption. So when we have somebody who is a diabetic, they probably don't want to be slamming tons of fruit juice for their carb source with a meal with no fiber. Why? The fiber helps to slow down the absorption of these different carb sources via an ileal break effect, kind of slowing down that, that absorption through the small intestine. And then what winds up happening is you don't get this rapid influx of fuel source on in a circumstance where somebody actually has metabolic dysfunction. So their cells, their powerhouses, the mitochondria can't take the fuel effectively. So you start flooding them with fuel, you can start to create issues, whereas you have the fiber, it slows things down. Plus you have the shift in the microbiome as well. However, somebody who's an athlete, needs to eat a ton of calories on a regular basis, probably doesn't want to be slamming tons of of fiber sources because it's going to be hard to eat enough because you're going to get so much volume. So we want to construct our diets with these in mind. Maybe we want some sources that are higher in carbohydrates that absorb rapidly, white rice, juices, but we have them in the context of a whole meal, protein, fat, and fiber. Maybe it's a glass of grape juice with a steak, with some potatoes, with some cooked carrots there, and then with an avocado or some butter in the potato or something like this, that'll that will help to minimize the speed in which this, this, this carb source hits the system.
So the blood glucose regulation and speed of absorption is important. Another thing to consider with the blood glucose regulation is what are you using to manage the blood glucose, right? Or what are the effects of the different carbohydrates on blood glucose? So the first thing is when you're looking at something like sugar, like sucrose, it has glucose and fructose. You are not going to get a high blood glucose spike to the same extent as if you had just pure glucose. Why? Because the the fructose doesn't elicit this, uh, the insulin spike, the blood glucose level doesn't spike the blood glucose level as, uh, as much as glucose. And it doesn't signal that, that insulin signaling quite as much. Whereas when you start to get to something like starches, it's pretty much pure glucose. You get a rapid spike in, in blood glucose, and you also get an increase in insulin release because you have this higher blood glucose response. So the sugars in general, while they are absorbed more rapidly, have a different effect on blood glucose levels and insulin signaling than if you had starches or pure glucose, which are made the starches maybe absorbed a little bit slower because this pure glucose will hit the blood glucose levels a bit differently. So these are important distinctions and nuances to understand when you're choosing different carbohydrate sources. The last thing I want to talk about here, because I think a lot of people watching this video will likely be coming from a low carb background, is caloric stability. So what do I mean by this? When you are starting to add carbs into your diet, you want to figure out where your caloric target is, or your energy needs are, right? It's just a ballpark to know how much energy do you need for your activity level and for what you're doing on a regular basis so you don't start gaining weight. Why do I say this? I've helped hundreds of people at this point come off a low carb diet. And the number one problem I run into across the board is I wanted to add carbs in my diet. So I kept eating all of my steak and butter. And then I just added juice and honey and maple syrup on top. And then I started to gain weight. And like, yes, you're going to gain weight. If you do that, you can't slam 150, 200 grams of fat a day with your 100, 150 grams of protein, whatever the deal is, and then start to add carbs on top. You're going to have to bring fat down. You're changing your fuel substrate. So you're going to want to spring fat down a bit and bring carbs up and do it slowly so that your body can shift appropriately from oxidizing fatty acids to oxidizing carbohydrate. And then the one other thing you might see here is you may gain like five pounds initially very quickly. It's the same five pounds that you lose very quickly when you go on keto or low carb, and that is glycogen refilling. So a lot of people go on keto or low carb, they lose five pounds or 10 pounds, depending on their size. Like, wow, this diet is really great. And it's like, yes, you just lost glycogen and which is basically glycogen and water weight. Whereas when you add carbs in, you gain a quick five pounds usually. And then people are like, oh, wow, this, the carbs are making me gain weight. And it's like, no, that's water and glycogen. That's not body fat. It's very different. When you're in a low carb diet, you deplete glycogen and one part glycogen comes with three parts water so that the water obviously has a decent amount of weight to add. So this is what we see with a lot of people is they're usually flat and low carb and then they add in carbs and now they have holding more water. Muscles are more, more full of glycogen, livers more full of glycogen and they have a little bit more weight. But again, it's unlikely to be body fat, especially if calories are dialed in effectively. With that said, what are the carb sources that we want to use? Well, the first group I would consider would be fruits. The benefits of fruits is they are easily digested. They have a high polyphenolic content that can help to modulate the microbiome plus the fibers. And then they also have a decent nutrient profile for things like potassium, which grains do not have. The thing to watch out with with fruit, the major thing is mostly the high FODMAP content and also the glucose to fructose content. Because again, those can cause the digestive issues. Fruits in general tend to have less problematic compounds that can cause irritation like alkaloids or something like this because the fruit is actually being created by the plant for the animal to eat to spread the seeds. So they're, the plant is not trying to poison the animal with the fruit at this point. An unripe fruit may be because it doesn't, the fruit, fruit isn't ripe yet, so it's not meant to be eaten. So the, the plant does not want the animal to eat it at this point, so it keeps some defensive compounds in there. But once the fruit is fully ripe, it shouldn't have so much defensive compounds because it's trying to entice the organism to actually eat this to spread the seeds somewhere else. Now, sources of fruits that we can look to would be whole fruits, fresh fruits, dried fruits, 100% fruit juice, and also smoothies. When we're looking at the, when we're looking at these different options, again, keep in mind FODMAP content and glucose to fructose content of these different options, uh, as well as how much fiber something has, especially if you have a gut issue, you may want to not have a massive amount of fiber to start. So you maybe you want to shoot towards something like melons, which don't have as much fiber than to slam a bunch of raspberries, which are very high in fiber from the seeds, particularly lignans. Now, the next group that we'll look at is tubers. The benefit of tubers, so these, these are things like potatoes, things like taro, yams, sweet potatoes. They're easily digestible for a lot of people, especially if you do well with starches. They do have a high polyphenolic compound and nutrient profile that helps to modulate the microbiome. Plus they have the fibers. But something to keep an eye out for is they do tend to have FODMAPs, 
They do. So that's things like sweet potatoes and yams. They do tend to have alkaloids. That's things like white potatoes. And they do tend to have oxalates, which are things like taro. So ideally, we want to be cooking these things well. For taro, we want to boil it to get out the oxalates. For potatoes, we want to peel the skin to get rid of the alkaloids. And we want to make sure they're cooked well. And then for sweet potatoes and yams, we want to watch out for getting a lot of bloating and gas from the FODMAP content. Now, the last group that I want to run through here is grains. Now, there are some grains that a lot of people tend to tolerate that don't have the problematic proteins like gluten or too heavy in lectin content and do tend to show benefits inside the research for metabolic function and for weight regulation and microbiome regulation, et cetera. The first one is going to be oats. Now, oats are a little less easily digested than something like white rice, which we'll talk about next, but they do have a, a decent a nutrient profile. They do have some anti-nutrients like phytic acids. So we want to watch out for that. But then they also have uh, some decent, uh, they're usually digested pretty well by most people. They do have some decent polyphenolic compounds like the avananthamides. And then the oats can have a helpful effect on managing blood sugar because of the fiber type, the beta glucan content in the oats. So the oats can be quite helpful overall. A lot of people like them. They taste good, especially with a little maple syrup honey or some fruit in them. And they also tend not to give mass amounts of digestive issues for most people. They can, do have some FODMAP content. They can be fermented, but overall they seem to be well tolerated. And they don't have too many negative compounds in them, especially if they're, they're soaked or sprouted or something like this before being cooked. Oats do have a high phosphorus content and they don't have a great potassium content. This is a problem with grains. This can, if you have a high grain-based diet on top of having a high protein content, this can really skew the calcium, the phosphorus ratio and lead to uh, changes inside parathyroid hormone regulation, which can affect bones, vascular function, kidney health, et cetera. So the fruits are helpful because they're very high in potassium. If you have a grain-based diet, it's very difficult to get enough potassium. Whereas if you have a tuber or fruit-based diet, it's very easy to get enough potassium. So that's something to keep in mind in terms of some of the hormonal regulation. Now, the next one is white rice. Now, white rice isn't particularly nutrient-dense. It's also not really rich in any fibers. But the benefit of, is it, of it is many people tolerate it quite well. It's very easily digested. A lot of people enjoy it. And so it's a great source, just pure glucose, essentially, without too many anti-nutrients or toxic compounds or things that are caused digestive issues. The only thing I'd say is I wouldn't make it the primary carbohydrate source unless you're really dialing in nutrients in other areas of the diet because it does lack some of the, the vitamin and mineral content that we want. And it also lacks some of the polyphenol compound and gut microbiome modulatory effects. A side note on white rice is if you cook it and then you cool it, you can create resistant starch. This can create bloating, gas, digestive issues for, for some people. Now, some people have no problem with it. So if you don't have a problem with it, whatever, enjoy your rice if it's cooked or cooled. If you do have a problem with it, try to have your rice fresh. You can use a rice cooker to keep it warm all day long. That'll help to minimize the resistant starch. If you reheat it a bit, you can lower some of the resistant starch content, but it needs to be reheated back up to a higher temperature and then eaten from there. And you still will have some resistant starch. So with that said, these are the major carb sources that I would look to incorporate uh, in your diet, if you're transitioning from a low carb diet, or you're just looking at which carb sources do you add in. And then there's, here's some rationale and context around the individual carb sources. So you can make the appropriate selections. If you have any questions about carb sources, please shoot a comment down below and I will make uh, videos on the, the questions that you have in the future. And I'll catch you in the next video.